Hey, what's up, Scott Balgram here with Imagination Creation Films, and today, well, it is August 12th. You know, every time I, I welcome the, I, I looked down at the date because, yeah, it's, it's, it's a thing. Uh, yeah, we're live. It's, uh, it's Friday. That means we have a live stream. It also means, since the guests are back, we have guests. Our guest today is Ryan Avery, and it's going to be a fun one. It is going to be a shorter one today. He can't go eight hours, so Charles, your 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 record is safe for a while. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, right before I bring him in here, just real quick, uh, these times on Fridays are varying based upon the guest's availability. So make sure on your subscription that you have uh, the alert bell, note the little thing checked. So that you get notified when these things are going to happen. So let's just bring in Ryan Avery. Hi, Ryan. How are you? I'm great, Scott. Good to see you. <laughs> so introduce yourself briefly, and then we're just going to dig right on into to reality. Um, my name is Ryan Avery. Uh, I'm 40 years old. I live in uh, Southern California. I don't know what you want. Do you like long walks beside the beach? Or? I like long walks off short piers, you know, stuff like that. Well, I mean, uh, what are you known for? What do you, uh, what, what, when people know you, I mean, I kind of see a logo, but I mean, there's. You know. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a really good poker player. You know, there's that. Um, I work for, <laughs> I work for um, Tokina Cinema um, as the vice president of sales. I also do research and development marketing, uh, pretty much anything connected to Tokina Cinema. Um, I own a company called uh, Rivar Cine which uh, we make uh, rotopolas and specialty diopters. We'll get into that later. Um, yeah, there's uh, quite a few things um, that I do. Uh, I used to own some optical companies. I worked for, yeah, so I do gl glass lens, anything glass related to cinematography. I am uh, aware of it, uh, involved in it in some way, um, primarily in future looking technologies sort of thing. So, did I mean it? it it's interesting because you're not a filmmaker per se, correct? Is right. right. I mean, I did that, photography. I used to do photography when I was young. That's how I got into it. But um, no, I'm not a filmmaker. I've shot a total of maybe a hundred feet of film in my life, and it was because I accidentally bumped the button with a magazine <laughs> in the car. <laughs> it's just well, now we got to develop that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm not a filmmaker, and my job is to listen to filmmakers and to uh, gather information, look at current technologies, look at future technologies, and kind of put it all together and find a way uh, for uh, the companies I work with to produce products that filmmakers like and need. But oddly, it is a creative type position. You're not. You're not just. You're, you're not just taking the specifications from the customer and giving them to the engineer. You are. You're. You're aggregating and determining and finding, finding problems that deserve solutions. Is is, is that correct? Actually? Yeah, I would say I would say that's that's fair. I mean, it's it's an interesting combination of technology. Um, um, technology stuff and it's also an interesting um combination of um of uh looking at talking to creatives looking at films and things that are produced looking for trends um talking to filmmakers what they need uh talking to engineers and translating to that into what they need i also get to the incredible opportunity to do really fun stuff that is you know kind of unrelated um so yeah and if I disappear, don't just keep on going because you'll you'll still be connected to the world. So, it, it, my my Starlink does its little thing every once in a while, but I'll, I'll come back. Unlike my previous internet. Um, so, when when did you take an interest that you know? Because all things visual, all things glass, uh, refractory, I guess would be the the term. Uh, when did you take an interest in that? Where where did that come from in your world? Uh, I started initially by um, um, working in, I, well, I took an interest in, in uh, photography when I was about 11 years old. Um, and my dad bought me a um, SLR camera and uh, a Pentax K1000. And I started shooting film and begging 
people to take me to Walmart to um, develop it and stuff like that. And I was always interested in the technology side of it. And uh, I read the B&H catalog cover to cover um, nightly. Uh, I don't know why I was interested in that part, but I was. And so it uh, that went really well. And then um, I decided I wanted to work in a camera store. And so uh, I went uh, to a camera store and when I was 15 and I begged them to let me work there doing anything. And uh, they said, all right, we'll let you sweep the floors, <laughs> literally. And so <laughs> I started doing that and I was just happy to be working at a camera store. And um, one day, one of the salespeople went to lunch or something, and I sold this giant package to a guy because I was a Nikon N90 with like a whole bunch of stuff. And um, came back from lunch, and the manager said, "You're in sales now." So that was kind <laughs> of how it started. Um, and yeah, just kind of one thing led to another, and uh, you know, I went to law school in between, and um, I worked at I worked for Ritz Camera at the time. It was Kit's Camera, and then it became Ritz Camera. And then ultimately, uh, I moved away from them and started working for um, Schneider Optics later in my career, or Sammy's camera, and then later Schneider Optics. So I had about 10 years in camera stores, and then uh, now about 15 or more years in um, working for manufacturers or being a manufacturer. And was was optics something that you just kind of fell into, like, like it just started making sense, or was it something that was like purely purely interest you you love that side of it or uh for the optic side of it it was it was always interesting to me because you know glass is what we use to make the images um so uh that was always interesting to me and i i uh traded used lenses as well so i got to learn lenses a lot and um and then uh it just so happened i wanted to work in the industry i didn't have a specific uh company that i wanted to work for but i knew i wanted to work for a manufacturer so i ended up going to work for um uh, for Schneider Optics, which then kind of sealed that deal. Um, but the time that I went to work for Schneider, I, I had never been inside of a, a cinema. I'd never been on a set. I'd never been to a cinema rental company. I was coming from the photography side. I sold lighting and professional cinema cameras, but it wasn't the same, you know. And it was like for videographers, basically. Mm -hmm. um, there was even camera stores. So, um, so yeah, so sold that's what ended up Lowell happening. The kit, the, the Lowell Toda, and the is that yeah, what you sold? <laughs> I sold a lot of Lowell Toda lights before they were bought by Tiffin. Um, yep. Yeah, so uh, so yeah, that was that was kind of how I got into it, and I ended up going to a rental company that's now out of business, but they had just started. And my my um my boss at the time at Schneider handed me, and he said, "I want you to go talk to a bunch of rental houses." We don't talk to any of them. And so my job was to drive around and talk to rental companies and go to sets and stuff. And so I ended up learning a ton. And I just went around asking people, you know, sweeping the floors or otherwise, what do you do here? What's going on? You know, and so you end up having a lot of conversations and end up having success by proxy of just being around people and, uh, that sort of thing. And so I went into a rental company, Dalsa, which I said is now out of business. Um, and there at the time they were spending un ungodly amounts of money. Um, and so I walked in there my boss said, go visit these guys, find out what's up. They gave me this massive purchase order for tons and tons of filters. <laughs> and I walked mm -hmm. back and that kind of cemented the deal with my boss. It was like, all right, you're all right. It had nothing to do with me. I just walked in there. But you just happened to receive the order. <laughs> yeah. I just walked in at the right time and they were like, oh, you're a good salesman. We'll do that. So yeah. So that's how that worked out. So, I mean, if you, if you go from there and, and we could kind of fill it in a little bit, but I mean, and then today where you're making some of the, well, I mean, some of the sharpest, most desirable uh, it's, it's hard to phrase that because there, there's definitely higher end glass but not a lot uh comp for you know compared to the the tequila vistas um th they are really really high quality compared to the well the price i mean there was nothing like that really before right so what how did you get to vista how did well, I mean, how did you get to that point where you said, this is what needs to happen? Oh, it was a long process. So I did the product development. Um, I learned how to do product development at Schneider. I, um, I was, uh, what, where do it start even? Uh, there was a man who was an absolute legend um, in the business, um, Bob Zipka. He designed the great majority of the Schneider motion picture television filters. And I had the good fortune of uh, being on his team in a sense, 
of um, making filters. I, so I help with the design specification in a way of finding out the customers and stuff, uh, what they wanted, uh, customers being rental companies, directors of photography, et cetera. And so we ended up making some really cool filters, including the Hollywood Black Magic, which uh, I'm still proud of to this day because it's probably one of the most ubiquitous filters in the business. I think most people know that one. And um, like I said, I just was tangentially involved, although I learned a lot there about developing an optical product and all the things that go into it because it's a little bit different than um, other products, I believe. So, um, so I did that. And then uh, Schneider in 2009, we were at NAB when it used to be a much bigger show. It was like a huge deal in 2009 time or so, mm -hmm. 2008. My first NAB was NAB 2006, um, right when Red started. So that was an interesting juncture and we could wander off the cart path on that. But uh, <laughs> point being, I, uh, uh, Schneider showed up and they had a, um, a industrial lens that they were, because Schneider's a huge industrial lens company. And they had taken an industrial lens and anodized it red color because red had just come out. And they're like, hey, these are cinema lenses for red. And so, um, they were like, okay, well, we told them, you know, and I didn't know a lot about developing cinema lenses at the time. And Schneider was not selling cinema lenses at the time. We were selling photographic lenses, motion picture filters. And so uh, they said, okay, well, I told them, well, you know, come back uh, when you've got something. Because I talked to some customers and they said, no, this isn't going to work. It has to be like black and it needs to be, you know, because this was just a tube with elements in it. So they took those industrial optics and they uh, rehoused them into what they considered to be a, pre a uh, proper cinema lens, which was in fact not at all um because it was developed in a black box in germany uh and all due respect to my former colleagues there it was a beautiful lens they just didn't ask anybody about functionality so um for example the iris was in front of the uh focus which was you know not a yeah. good thing for most nope. people nope. uh i can't remember if the focus turned the wrong direction or not i think it did but maybe it didn't it went the nikon way i don't know um, and then the worst part was the front. This is the Cine Xenar one. The front part telescope, um, which of course yeah. as you know with map boxes that's, that's is an absolute no. <laughs> no go. Um, so they brought that. I showed it to several customers, um, and then it just kind of was like fizzled out, and nobody wanted it um, even for the price. And you got to realize at the time there weren't any other modern cinema lenses going on for digital, other than like you know. Um, Zeiss was doing stuff a little bit, but digital was like still brand new. I mean, the, a lot of the shows like, you know, the, the, the God awful star Wars trilogies in the middle, I know that'll cause some problems, but, uh, I hate those <laughs> movies, the middle ones. One, two um, and three. I don't, I don't even know what you're talking about. What yeah. You know? Right. Uh, and, uh, I have a fun story about that, but, um, that, um, they were using Sony F 900s and things with filter wheels and cameras with two stops of dynamic range and yeah so um so yeah so we i could go off on a million tangents. i, I think there were five stops of dynamic range in that camera don't don't, don't maybe don't i don't know down and make it sound yeah bad. <laughs> <laughs> that was what was in the brochure uh, i was thinking of the viper camera i don't know if you remember that one but the viper camera was was i think it had like none in fact i was i was involved a little bit with the production of this tv show the office with the uh, products and we made some lenses for there and if you look at some of their episodes they have the inside the car with michael and dwight riding around early on and it's just the sky is totally blown out um <laughs> yeah so that's where we were at the time and uh so then they went back to the drawing board and they made cine xenar 2 which was the same functionality they got the iris in the right location and uh the front stop telescoping um but they also uh raised the price like a lot um and so and it was a helicoid design which means that the focus ran on a gear or on a on like a um a helicoid a, a screw basically kind of like the old zeiss super speeds did and the problem with that when you have heavier glass is that it causes torque on the on the, the two threads right and it causes torque which causes issues with image alignment and other stuff and durability and because of the huge price hike it just wasn't um worth it so they went back again uh to their credit and said all right third time we're gonna get this right and so we did a bunch of research uh, i remember some people that are still around uh, mitch gross was helping us um at able at the time and and basically we spent a lot of time with the rental companies and they showed schneider that they need to have an internal cam design uh which you know the optics move on a on a track with a little follower in it like a little wheel that kind of goes along the track rather than a helicoid and so those are the kind of things 
that um, I learned. And then uh, Phil, as he says here, that he uh, first, let's see, what did he say? This man sold me my first set of cinema glass. <laughs> um, and that was the Cine Xenar 3s. Uh, so Phil right. was uh, one of the customers. And uh, they were great lenses. They were super 35. They are super sharp, telecentric, just beautiful glass. Um, and they, they took that awesome optics that Schneider had, the heritage, and then they, they stuffed that into the, the correct housing. But the problem there was that market uh, Schneider had challenges marketing it. Um, and also, it was a little bit early. There wasn't enough digital cameras out there to really make a difference. And they weren't, even though they worked on film, it wasn't, you know, film was still the old standbys, you know, why would you shoot anything other than Arier's Ice because of beautiful glass and trusted for film, right? On shoot, whatever. Um, so that was the challenge that Schneider had. And then uh, come along 2011 or 12, the full frame, uh, the 5D Mark III, I think, two. was out at that time. Two. Four? Two? Well, I don't know. Well, the, yeah. two, the two was the one that, that took everything by storm that everybody wanted. It was right after that. It was the one after that. I don't remember if they did oh, a three, three that they went to four. Somebody's going to get angry and say, it just Canon was like Mark three. It was introduced on this date. Um, 2014, 2013, somewhere around there was Mark. Yeah, Mark so the III. development started in 2012, maybe, or something like that. And it was myself and Nikki Mustaine, who now works at Roscoe. She was with Tiffin for a while. Um, a good colleague of mine. She um, she and I worked on the, in driving um, our German colleagues around and um, telling them what they want. So we developed these full frame lenses. And that's how I met Phil Holland, since he's talking about it. Uh, I saw him on Twitter. This is in 2014, I think. I saw him on Twitter and I, I said, uh, I didn't know him. And I was like, hey, dude, want to try some lenses? And so we just met up and he tried some lenses. And he ended <laughs> up buying like, the older Do version. I? <laughs> yeah. Um, and there you go, Bob, too. Uh, yep. So that, that's right. I came to Toronto. That was like the one time, no, two times I came to Toronto. We, we had a bar. We bought out, not buy out a bar, but we just we kind of took over a bar in downtown and we had a bunch of people there. Um, so um that was fun and so we had this the xenon full frame primes is what i'm referencing and uh those were great they were four thousand dollars a piece at the time they were they were ahead of their time for sure um you know and that was those just based off what people wanted uh, you know it's not hard to make a good product if you actually listen to what people want and don't sit inside your own echo chamber you know agreeing with yourself those, those were my first Sydney lenses. Uh, I was I was really proud. I, I've told this story on here numerous times. So proud of them. I was building up the set. I had I think I got up to four of them. And someone asked me, he's like, "Hey, do you have that that uh, that CA problem on on the Xenon?" I'm like, "What do you mean?" And they're like, uh, you, "You don't have a CA?" I was like, "I've never seen it." And then I looked, and I'm like, "Son of a," and, you know, I couldn't unsee it at that point. It was it was glaring. Super sharp lenses, lots of beautiful character, tons of CA. What was? Yeah. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to bash it. I'm just you know sharing. Share I'm the, agreeing with you. I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. What it was? It was what? a function because it's classic lens design. Sorry, what did you say? No. I, yeah. Go ahead. I mean, that's, that's it, where I was going. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, it's no. a. It's a. You're the um, guest. Classic. Do what you it's want. <laughs> Um, all right, let's talk about golf. No, I hate golf. Um, <laughs> I love uh, golf. <laughs> nah, well, I used to play. Anyway, that's another story. Um, so um, the the Cine Xenars, um, the reason they had that CA is because they're a classic lens design. The Xenar lens design is from the 50s or 60s, something like that. I think it's the 50s. Someone's going to get mad and say what it is. I'm, you know, But it was around that time, and I should know more specifically. But I remember... The, the head designer at Schneider, there were two of them. Uh, there's a lady named Hildy who had been there forever. I'm talking like 50, 60 years. Um, I haven't talked to her since I left the company. Um, I hope she's well. And then there was uh, Udo Schaus, who was the designer. And they had this office in the upstairs of the Bod Kreuznach factory, which is a factory that was built around just before World War II. Um, to walk around that, you know, you imagine what they made at that time. It was like right, submarine right. scopes and stuff and not for the Americans. Um, so uh, they had an upstairs uh, office in this like concrete bunker type building. It's an interesting building. And um, in there they had all these drawers, you know, those map drawers that you see or used to be able to see it like an outdoor adventure thing with these wide trays with all yeah, the really wide, different yeah. 
So they had those and inside those were all these yellowed papers with every design Schneider ever had. And so I spent an entire day in there talking to Udo and Hildy about it. And they'd been together at the company so long, they'd shared an office for an, a crazy amount of time. I don't remember 40, 50 years, whatever it was. And they called him inside of Schneider, the married couple, even though they weren't married. Um, and so they showed me everything. And so and I remember seeing the original Xenar design and then I, I believe they modified it slightly. Um, I wasn't entirely hip to exactly what they did, but it's based off of the Schneider uh, Xenar design from the 50s, I think. Um, because Schneider started making lenses for Kodak after World War II. Um, so that's kind of how that went about. So that's why they had CA, I believe. Uh, also the Iris. They, they really, they were in, very interested in keeping a faster, relatively faster stop. Mm -hmm. um, Those are T21s, right? T2. Yeah, it, they really would have been better off. And, and we had received a lot of feedback. They should have just been limiting the iris, which is a thing that can happen. A lot of these lenses are obviously capable of having faster irises, but they're not because they're limited to reduce chromatic aberration. And that's oh, what happened okay. with the Xenar, the Cine Xenars. So, um, yeah. Interesting. So anyway, uh, we developed that. And then, uh, yeah, you got a question? No. no, no, no. I'm just, We're getting to Tokino. We're getting there slowly. I'm, I'm interacting. Uh, I'm just, you know. <laughs> um, so, uh, so then I decided to leave Schneider in 2013, and um, I was offered a business development job. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I was like, you know, I like working for manufacturers, but I want to do something different. And so I took a business development job with Film Tools, which lasted a spectacular six months. Um, and, uh, that's a, um, a great, great company these days. Um, at the time they had a lot of challenges. So, um, I left that and at the same time I decided that, um, when I worked at Schneider that, uh, they sold a lot of, um, glass for rot rotopolas. Mm -hmm. And so in 2014, I went to NAB without a job and I, uh, I hired an engineer friend of mine I knew to design the Revarsini Rototray, which is now the best-selling rototray by far and um, there's tens of thousands of them out there and it's been gratuitously copied by multiple um yes, it has. other companies <laughs> which is a credit i guess um i, I yeah it's, a it's shady, not a badge of, it, of happiness it's a <laughs> you know uh, success is what do they say imitation is the the just there is form of flattery. Uh, yeah, that's that's something that someone who copied you would say. <laughs> at the same time, anyway, at the same no, I'm saying it, but at the same time, um, I have thoughts on that that are you know, if anybody tries to copy you, there's a lot of great things about that, um, more so than meets the eye. But um, uh, so I designed, I did that, and that was reverse and I started that, and at the same time, I started talking to an optical engineer that worked at, at Schneider named Va uh, named uh, Jim Zhang. And he wanted to, he was supplying their Sentry Optics stuff because uh, Schneider owned Sentry. Um, that's mm -hmm. how I met Jim when I worked there. And then he was an independent uh, engineer manufacturing and producing stuff. And so um, uh, I said, hey, let's make some lenses. And calling back on my time from the original Cine Xenars, I knew those were based on industrial lenses. And a lot of industrial optics have some great features. They're primarily telecentric. So... Um, that means the focus doesn't really breathe, even though they're not used in that way. Um, they're relatively low cost because there's a very high volume of production. Um, and so I told Jim, I said, Hey, what if we took some industrial optics lenses, put them inside of a, um, uh, uh, proper cinema housing and made them for a smaller format, because then you'd have very low cost lenses that you could sell and market, um, for very high quality. And because Micro Four Thirds was coming up at the time, we kind of doubled down on that. The GH4 was brand new, I think, or was it the GH3? Right. GH4 was, and, was yeah. Big yeah. And uh, people that helped with that effort was uh, Ilya Friedman and Matthew Duclos were involved in that in the early development. And then we started the company and it was quite successful. Um, and we developed a whole bunch of new focal lengths. We had a whole roadmap for Super 35 and full frame lenses and zooms even and anamorphic and all kinds of stuff. There was actually an active development. But um, what ended up happening uh, is longer than this I have today. But basically, there was a significant um, dispute between me and my business partner, Jim, over um, intellectual property and a few other things. Um, and ultimately, uh, we had to close the company. And it was like a really long, drawn out lawsuit that went on. Um, I guess I could say pretty, pretty 
pretty soundly that I won that. <laughs> so, cause I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't do anything wrong. I still maintain that. So, um, it just was an unfortunate set of circumstances. Those designs ended up making their way out into the market under the make name, which is still being uh, marketed and they're doing an awesome job of uh, that. So they've taken a lot of the work that I did and they've done their own thing with it and really improved on it and made it way better than Vader ever could have been in terms of quality production, everything. So I have a lot of respect for them, um, not only because they're continuing on with things that I worked on originally, um, but through that, I learned, through Vader, I learned, obviously, uh, kind of got the uh, black belt in um, optics development because, you, you know, you're learning right. it. Um, and so I learned a lot there, learned a lot about business, learned a lot about um, product development. Um, oh, and I will mention going back with Vader, of course, Phil, uh, Phil Holland, he helped us name it. So that was huge. Um, <laughs> so he deserves the credit for that. Um, so anyway. Um, I learned a lot about that. And then from that, I, when, uh, Vader was winding down, Revar Cine was still operating. Um, I got a, um, a, uh, a call from, or no, I went to photo keynote. It was a trade show in Germany. Um, mm -hmm. it used to happen every two years, I think, or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, right. I think it's still around, but it's definitely dwindled off. Um, Photokina was like a moderate show at the time. And I went there looking for stuff to distribute, ways to make money to feed my family in addition right. to Rivar City. And I met with the people at Format and they had a, um, at the time they were a small independent company and they had a, um, uh, what do you call it? A, um, uh, to, to go back, Schneider, I was involved in the development of the, the platinum IRNDs at Schneider. Uh -huh. um, and it, during the IRND race, I call it in the uh, 2007 to 2013, it was pretty much the initial game was over at that point. And then uh, Format iterated upon that in a better way. So Format was one of the first companies in addition to Matomo uh, in Japan to um, create uh, carbon-based IRNDs, which are far more neutral and now every brand on right. the market for iron d is um is uh um and the, the carbon-based type those filter. Are the fire crest correct here's the fire crest filters and so they hired me and they said all right we'll tell you what we'll hire you to be a sales rep for the us just go sell our product whatever and we'll pay you a commission fine i took the set to um panavision and at the time, and Panavision uh, immediately was like, oh, this is great, we'll buy a bunch of these. And then they put them, first thing they did was, um, this is Panavision, first thing they did was put them on Rogue One. So like right away, then we had that, you know, cool Star Wars thing. Um, and then uh, um, it just kind of built from there. And then uh, in 2015 uh, or 16 or late 15, Tokina um, asked me to consult for them on the Vista Prime line. Um, and I found out, uh, consecutively at the same time, completely different tracks uh, that they were purchasing Format High Tech because they're a uh, conglomerate company that purchases. They own Hoya and Koken and Slick right. and like all they these. They like huge, to have yeah, yeah. diversification. Huge group. Uh, the owner of Tenko Tokina believes in owning the entire market, no matter what slice he gets of it. So he just buys companies or he distributes them or anything he can do to get you know everything, which is a really fascinating and I think really good business model, honestly. Um, so um, they, I became a de facto uh, Tokina employee <laughs> by uh, Format. I was working for Format. I still do. I'm involved with Format High Tech USA. Um, but my primary focus is entirely on cinema products, um, which we've improved upon. And so uh, that's how we get to Tokina. And uh, they showed me a lens, and it really wasn't quite what I was. Uh, they said, was we want to get a prime, or was it one of the, the zooms? It was a prime. At the time, Tokina was selling the 16 to 28, which they started yep. with, which was uh, direct credit of Matthew Duclos rehousing it, uh, Paul and Matthew rehousing the 11, or not rehousing, but I guess you could say, yeah, putting, putting a proper cinema front on the uh, 11 to 20, or 11 right. to 16, excuse me. And so Tokina had that which was their own version of it that wasn't that was more consumer based and very affordable they had the 50 to 135 mark one which is like a bigger lens right. and then they had the 16 to 28 uh, mark two which happened to be full frame all those were based off photo lenses that they brought into a right. cinema housing so that's where tokina was at at the time uh cinema uh they had a lot of success with the 11 to 16 the other focal lengths weren't really selling that well um but they they saw a cinema coming and um 
So, uh, you know, the market expanding because the photography, the professional photography market has just fallen off a cliff because of the iPhone and, and mm -hmm. you know, cinema yeah. and a number of reasons. And it's way um, too easy to carry it in your pocket. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> excuse me, I started developing that and then um, they showed me uh, this lens and I was like, man, this thing is giant chunk of glass like it was i was like this is ridiculous and i told him at the time i was like i don't know guys <laughs> like because sigma had just announced or were going to announce their uh their cinema primes right based off the art glass and mm -hmm. so i was looking at this ginormous hunk of glass going oh good lord what are we going to do with this you know but um so there were a lot of things that needed to be changed so i made some suggestions looked at the optical design some tweaks were made as to your reflections and things and I, I told him i said you guys have to make really fast really big image circle glass it's the only way to uh come in against you know other competitors that have been doing this for a right. hundred years i mean it, you want to talk about an impossible task for a company i'm like it has to be the best optical quality hands down and um the man who designed it is nobuo seki he still works for the company he's the head optical designer and um there's only one word i have to describe him which is optical rocks optical design rock star that guy is just unbelievable um and there's a lot of it's confidential but he's been involved in uh, uh, a shockingly large number of other products on the market over the years of his career um i i believe one of the single handed there's a guy at nikon that's that's just as good if not better i mean there's there's some really good optical designers out there but he's really really good and so um you know they just i asked them i said you got to pull out all the stops 100 percent. this is the bet just go for pure image quality and the thing weighs it weighed quite a bit you know it does still and um you know but the optical quality is amazing and so so i said all right and they had three lenses they were like we're gonna well the first they showed me a 50 and then they came out with a 35 and an 85 not longer after and i said well this is not a professional lens set you guys need at least six and you really should have more um and so uh we started uh, showing it to people anybody that would look we shot some short films with it uh phil arntz did one i'm extremely proud mm -hmm. of uh, for him ostrich if you haven't seen ostrich yep. it's on it's a film supply it was like a film supply staff pick or something and or vimeo staff pick and all that sort of stuff and um phil holland shot a really good uh dispatcher uh, is really great um so we 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 got people that we really respected um their talents and also we really focused on up and coming cinematographers uh, you know um i think that that's I, you know, I told Tokina that's the way to make an impact is to support people that are starting out because people that are starting out, you know, eventually they're not starting out anymore. Right. You know, they're shooting major features and it happens faster than you realize. So um, that's how we got to Tokina and we've been very fortunate. Um, I think most people have no idea the number of feature films that our, the Vista Primes have been on. It's a shocking percentage of current feature films because they have a very flat uh, distortion. They have almost no distortion um, yeah. for the focal length, considering the size. I mean, I could get into it. We can get into it on on what yeah. makes a lens a lens and what makes it good. Yeah. But bottom line is the Tokinas, I'm immensely proud of the team that did them. Um, I am incredibly blessed to have been even remotely involved in it, to be honest. And I feel like um, uh, the level of, it, it's probably the thing, I, I probably will get back to the point where I realized it was probably one of the bigger things I did in my career as far as um, just a, a, a tremendously successful thing that's I mean, making an impact, a real impact on filmmaking. Um, I mean, Vistas are a, a seriously positive lens on the market. I mean, the only negative thing about a Vista is it's just, it's a little larger, it's a little heavier, and it's it's not a little but, bit larger. <laughs> it's really yeah. But I mean, what I you know. get with that is is unlike anything else because they are exceptionally sharp. They're very fast, very low distortion, and they have character. And that's 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 something that you know, like Sigmas are extremely sharp, but they don't have any character whatsoever. They're 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 surgically boring, and it's 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 a it's an odd thing in the world. But you know, Vistas almost everything looks great on a Vista. It's 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 similar to you know people go for that cook look and. You know, it's the same thing with the Vista. You need a you need a catchphrase for that, by the way. Oh, the, the cook look. Have you tried the Vista View? Or, <laughs> this, I don't yeah. know. 
Uh, well, with the interesting design point, when they're making the lenses, I said, you guys really need to strike the balance between um, that technical Zeiss, you know, really beautiful, sharp look and the um, really nice um, flares and things you get with a cook. And that's what they were able to accomplish quite well. It's it, People ask me, what does it look like? I say, well, it looks like Zeiss and Cook had a baby and there it is, you know. Um, and I will say, with your comment about Sigma and other things, um, I am a firm believer that every lens is a tool. Some are really bad tools, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> well, I mean, but that's a tool. <laughs> there are things that the Sigmas are great at, and I have multiple times recommended them to people. Mm -hmm. If somebody does a lot of uh, remote work or, uh, you know, smaller gimbals or needs to be more, you know, lighter... Uh, those are great lenses. Um, they are photo lenses, so they have a very high contrast. So when you're looking at a foreground and a background, um, there's like a kind of like almost like a really sharp fall off, even at wide open. You can notice it. It's a really high um, overused, ill-defined term of micro contrast, but, it, but it's like this really uh, high contrast look. And so it, it creates, it can create kind of a flat look to it. Um, but the vistas don't, they, they, and that is a function of the spacing and the size of the lens. Um, so, um, that's really where, uh, we were at. And, um, so, um, that's the difference with the vistas. They have a lot of fall off, um, from the subject. There's this gentle roll off from subject wide open or even stop down. There's a gentle roll off from subject to forward to background, which is, um, which is great. And so that's one of the features of it, and that's why people like the look of them. That big, heavy glass is a reason it's there. But yeah, it's not, exactly. It's it's yeah. It 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 may be a negative, but it's it for a reason that that is positive, and and it, it's very apparent when you put them on. You're like, oh yeah, oh, yeah, oh, these are pretty. I like these. <laughs> I mean, they're not they're not that. Big. I mean, they're not gratuitous. It's not like a, a twelve to one ingenue. I mean, they're not right. they're not ungodly heavy, but they are they are bigger. And that's right. the reason why. And uh, there are companies that have made uh, similar designs that are beautiful. I think one of the best, I mean, I'll just say it, best lenses on the market, in my opinion, Airy Signatures. Like those things are just amazing. Um, and those are a masterwork and Airy should be credited with that. And my former colleague at Schneider is the guy that did that, um, that brought that, uh, Thorsten Maywald. He brought that all the way. He was trying to do that at Schneider. He was trying to get Schneider to see that. They wouldn't see it. They didn't have the ability. Airy did. He went to work for them, and uh, those are absolutely incredible. I mean, they're very similar looking to a Vista, frankly, um, and that was part of it. Was um, the, the Airy signatures were under development at the time, obviously, so I didn't know that, but um, I knew that there would be uh, quality there, um, and so the um, so yeah, so that's that's why also Tokin is winning a lot of people over. Is is it's a pretty similar look. It's pretty close. Um, uh, the, the, but the sig the reason I bring up the signatures is they have a very light, when you have a lot of money to spend on materials, but that's why they're so expensive. The materials that they use are just absolutely incredible, you know? And so it's really lightweight. So you can make it smaller. We could make the Vista smaller and lighter. They would but, be a signature prime and they would be the same amount of money. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, and, and then everybody out there, if you have questions, uh, Ryan only has a limited time. So go ahead and ask the questions and, and stick them out there and I'll try to get to them and squeeze them in where they make sense. Uh, uh, poor Phil is going to have to spend more money. Uh, Brandon yeah. has a question and I've heard this a few times. So I think it's, I think it's a fair question with the focus ring becoming a little stiff on the, the vistas. Is there a, uh, a relubing service or anything that, well, it could be a couple of reasons. Um, one, it's a helicoid, uh, like kind of like there's a there's a hybrid cam helicoid design going on inside. So, um, so uh, that doesn't lend itself to the smoothest operation, which was one of the um, primary points of disagreement I had on the development of the lenses. But uh, at the time, Tokina was very interested in competing with Sigma because it was all kind of new. Um, and, uh, so the initial price point of them was lower. The price point of these has crept up and it's not because of inflation. It's because we're resolving some of the issues like that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I will say on the 85, uh, on the longer focal lengths, the glass is he even heavier. So there's that, but if it's getting stiffer, um, the initial vistas had a brass cam follower. So the, the little thing that routed around in the cam track that moved it was brass. And what ends up happening with brass, and I learned this with the Cine Xenar threes, um, is the brass starts to wear it starts to distort because it's not very strong 
And um, so it's a very, um, it's a very uh, higher strength material in like a structure standpoint, but it doesn't do well under pressure. So, um, so the brass rides in there and it creates it smoother than if it was aluminum. But the problem is the, um, the cam followers were not correct. So we changed them two times. Uh, there was um, some that were black were a different material and the current ones are white, which is a, a, P, a poly material, which mm -hmm. is much lighter. So Don't it is possible. Burn. Yeah, so it depends on the age. So Brandon, if your lens is uh, brand new in the last like two years, then you know that's a year, that's a warranty issue. Um, Lord knows what reason. Um, but the, the, um, it is possible to take, if you bought it used or bought it, it's older than it has an older cam flower design and you can, oh, there you go. It says his lens are older. Um, so you have brass cam followers more likely than not, which are causing that issue. You can get them, uh, replaced. Uh, we have uh, lens technicians. If you just go to, um, email Tokina cinema at FKT America, or go to the Tokina cinema US site site or contact scout or whatever we can get you in touch with someone who can change those at a reasonable price it's a, it's a fairly it's almost it's something you can do in a clean a clean and adjust situation which brings up the point vistas are high-end professional cinema lenses high-end professional cinema lenses are meant to be serviced on a regular basis yeah. they're not this is not an inexpensive photo lens if you want top right. performance out of them you have to maintain them so um if you haven't had a, a cla in recent times get one done and uh, we can get the cam followers and you'll be pleasantly surprised at the increase in performance. There you go, there you go, Brandon. Uh, is there anything that you want to show with anything that we've been talking about already or, or you, you want to, uh... Uh, what do you want me to show? <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm, just, I'm just asking, I, I, I don't want you to forget if you have something you want to show, you can show it. Just, um... I mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, I could, I could think of things, but I don't, you know, I just want to go trolling through the website. I, I can't think of anything in specific other than, um, uh, I guess to the comment of image circle, I think most people do not realize the, the actual image circle of the vistas. So image circle of the lens, there's, there's the area of illumination, which is how much light it throws out there. Then there's the area of intended definition. So you have illumination and definition. And a lot of people know this, but, um, the, um, the the illumination circle on the vistas is larger on most of them than alexa or covers alexa 65 open gate is huge um and they're t1.5 and they don't have a lot of chromatic aberration at that you get out to any other thing yeah. that's that large possible odds other stuff out there from time gone by and me or whatever they have they're slower and they have uh because they don't really need to be that fast and um they have a, a more chromatic aberration. So the, the area of illumination from the 35 mil up, it, uh, it covers uh, Vista Vision, um, and, or it covers Alexa 65 open gate, uh, and the wider ones cover all the way up to Alexa 65 5K, um, which is way bigger than Vista Vision. So um, they have the area of illumination that's larger. And the reason I mentioned that is um, I could go cvp on their website i guess i could show up but cvp has a tool that shows um a retailer in london that shows the um the illumination of they shoot it on a whiteboard we did the same right. thing we shot it and we showed I, the um illumination i remember you doing that right with the alexa 65 <laughs> you're doing that with the 18 and the 25 i, I can't remember that yeah um, um i don't know if i can find it while we talk but i'll try yeah, no feel free i mean i, I can start uh, Talking to, uh, so uh, Brandon was saying that the rental house near him mentioned that they had a larger interest in the Vista Ones over the traditional Vistas. Ah, uh, yes. and then he's, he's asking for opinions. I'm going to say that the, the Vista Ones blew me away. And, and I, I, I couldn't quantify it. I, I tried. They, they had a look that, to my eyes, were just right up my alley. And it's, it's right. interesting what what got you to the Vista ones and then you made them very limited and they're done. What, what got you there? What was that, that thought process? And um, yeah, let's find this. I think I should have pulled it. I didn't even think we'd get to the yeah. coverage thing. So it's going to take me too long to find it, but basically well, um, I have, I have some stuff to show it. Um, the Vista one uh, was um, I'm trying to think. Um, we announced that at NEB 2019, uh, there was a trend of kind of, what we call like dirty lenses, right? Vintage mm -hmm. lenses, whatever, uh, with lenses Vaseline. with yeah. character. Yeah. I mean, I love vintage lenses. I can talk all day about vintage lenses. I have all kinds, you know, I, I briefly started a website called lens finder to try to yep. 
create a culture of that, but nobody wanted to pay for the service of, you know, it was half the price of eBay for fees and nobody wanted right. to pay it. So um, lens finder does not exist because you people didn't want to pay it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, uh, oh, some Bob says, oh, anyway. Um, okay. Um, so <laughs> Bob Gundu just put up a distracting comment. Um, so anyway, go, Bob. um, um that Vista one. Oh, so, you know, there was the trend of that. We were getting a lot of, because the Vistas, going back to the design of the original Vista Primes, we designed them very intentionally with what we call a, wa a fragile waveform. So a lot of lenses, if you mess with the coatings or you mess with the spacing of, of the optics, the whole image goes to crap, right? Because it's, it's not made to do that. It's calculated for a very specific thing, right? And... Um, there's been a trend of modifying lenses, obviously. I mean, Panavision has been doing it forever, um, where they take, you know, Frankenstein, a bunch of optics together, make their own designs, whatever they have to do. Um, so there's a long history of that. And so what we were doing was when we made the Vistas, we made them intentionally to be messed with. Um, and so our initial messing with it, so to speak, was the Vista 1. Um, so I took um, 19 different coding formulations, I believe, and uh, Phil again um, went and I gave them to him and went over to Matthew Duclos and they tested a bunch and gave us some notes. And then I took those elements in various lenses. We had red ones. We had all kinds of different coding options. Um, we made the conscious decision not to add any other changes to it, just do some coding changes. Um, and so we arrived through trial and error. Um, I spent couple weeks in London doing a bunch of testing and stuff. And we just arrived at it through trial and error of, uh, of the, uh, um, the right coding formulation, which is actually just the front element is changed. There's no other changes to it. Um, and so we announced that in AB 2019 and, uh, you know, we accepted, uh, the whole intention with Vista one from go was to make it a limited edition product. And the reason for that is we weren't totally convinced that people would want it as a manufacturer. We didn't want to carry that much inventory. And, you know, cause when you got two of something, if you sell one thing, it's easy. If you sell two things, now you got to figure out, you know, do people want blue or red or what, are, you know, it's, it's, right, it's a right. mess. So, um, and at the end of the day, it's a business, so we have to be careful with that. So uh, we intended it to be a limited edition and that's exactly what we did. We made uh, 40 sets um, and that was that. Um, and at NAB 2019, we designed it specifically for rental companies. That was the reason that we got it because we figured this is a specialty lens. Uh, the people yeah. that are gonna want this are probably not gonna wanna buy just that. So we're gonna put that on as a specialty um, lens. And so that's what happened. And so it's just a coding change. We changed the barrel colors. It was pretty cool. I thought it was great. Um, people loved it. And then the world ended a few months later. And uh, so we had a nice little pause for a couple of years. And so, um, you know, we get a lot of demand to continue it, but we're just not going to because we we um, we made a limited edition mount. We you know, The only elements we have left are intended for service. Um, our original intention was complete and people really liked that. Um, we, we do plan to iterate upon that type of thing in future, um, lenses to where, um, you might potentially have the ability to, to do Vista one-esque things. Um, so buy a regular lens and then do what you want with it. Um, that's a possibility. I'm not saying that's a thing, but that's a possibility. Um, so we just, we felt like it was a moment in time. We probably might've continued to make it had the pandemic not happened, but because there was such a gap in time. Our right. corporate office saw it as this didn't sell very well. Um, so even though it did and is actually way more successful. So there are no more Vista ones left here um, in the in fact or at the distribution factory, wherever. Um, and so it's all like a used market. And uh, I kind of like that myself. <laughs> so well, it's, it's, I kind of like the idea of limited. It's, yeah, limited. It it's makes it more collectible and people are going to want to be, yeah. be more sought after. And I mean... Uh, then Phil will announce it and then everybody will go out and try to buy it and the price will go up through the roof. He's done numerous <laughs> times. <laughs> um, let's see, Brandon says, can you talk about the 16 and to 28 in particular? I'm curious about the Vista badge on that lens versus the 16, I think you mean 18 millimeter prime, but congrats yeah. on the 180, simply amazing engineering. Yeah, that is a huge class. That's 
Yeah, I only talked about the 180. The, the 16 and 28 is a rehouse of the Tokina 16 and 28 photo lens. It was originally in the Mark I version, which was a plasticky looking version before I came on right. board with the company. And obviously, you've seen that we've moved away from that um, particular design type into a more constant theme. Uh, it covers Vista Vision, it doesn't have the same image circle that the Vistas do. We call it a Vista primarily because it has the same ergonomics as the Vista Primes. It covers the same format, uh, although the Vistas co Vista Primes cover more. But that's generally true of zooms anyway. Zooms tend to have smaller image circles, right. um, which are variable as well, which is quite interesting. Um, but um, that that's what it is. And we also, we, we released that at the same time as the other Primes, as a 35, 15, 85 to kind of fill in. And so we were telling people at the time, if you really like these Vista Primes, because the color is a close match, you can, the flares are not, but the color is a close match. So we, um, but then again, on a wide lens, you're, you're generally, it's more like establishing shots and things where you're not, you know, you, you are flaring it a lot, but it's not the same. So um, we were selling it that way. And uh, that was good. Ironically, it became way more successful. I mean, that was mostly because of the increase in the number of full frame lenses, but it's one of our better selling lenses now. Um, and uh, people people have discovered it and like it. Um, so that's that's what it is with the Vista badge. So that's why it is what it is. Um, and obviously, uh, it's sitting alone as a Vista zoom. And uh, it doesn't take a great powers of deduction to figure out that we're probably going to make other Vista zooms. So. Well, it was uh, it was you who who passed along a, a little nugget of, of wisdom that I had never thought of, never even remotely thought about, and and it was because I had asked you why is it that twenty four to seventy or twenty you know those types of zooms why are they so boring why why can't they look fantastic and, and you had basically said because you're transitioning from a wide design to a telephoto design and it makes it difficult and mm -hmm. that it blew my mind that that I never thought about that that you're completely different designs what do you want to elaborate or i mean because it's, it's a common question people wonder why don't why isn't there like a you know a, a, like the 20 to 120 that why aren't there more of them out there that kind of thing yeah it's, zoom lenses are very difficult to to manufacture they have a lot of elements uh -huh. Pun in this, going back to puns, but, uh, they have a lot of elements involved in making it happen. Uh, um, but you, yeah, you've got um, basically a whole nightmare of moving elements going on, and it's a lot to keep track of and and work. And mechanics have to be very precise. And also the price of development. I think if everybody was willing to pay a hundred thousand dollars for a lens, like they were in the good old you know good old days of film when there was you know there's a reason they cost as much as they did back then but yeah that's that's why um they're very difficult to make especially at the price points that people expect uh we did come out with the 2575 which i know bob just commented is a great lens yep. i know he has one uh we're just starting with that and i think people don't know us for cinema zoom so that lens is, uh it's a misnomer because it's 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 marketed in our super 35 line because it's a 95 millimeter front um, I mean, which goes with our 11 to 20 and 50 to 135 lenses. They're all small, nice little zooms. You know, the 50 to 135 is a size of a pencil. It's, it's very know. small. Very it's pretty. very small, yeah. Um, uh, it breathes, which is another story, but I can get into it, that. It, but, it, um, it zooms. <laughs> yeah, it zooms when you focus. But that is because it's a compact telephoto lens. You can't have everything. You just can't. Um, and so, and again, going back to, I, I think I'm, Maybe I'm angling for Aerie to give me a job, but their signature zoom is is really, um, really about as good as it gets with that. But it's also a ton of money. Um, right. So that's that's where you're at with zooms. Like they're very hard to design. They're hard to manufacture. They're difficult for a lot of reasons. Photo lenses. There's a lot of photo lenses out there. Nobody has rehoused those because they're almost impossible to do for a number of reasons. And primarily, they breathe like crazy when you zoom them because they're not made to focus actively they're made to his stopping point and that's that um so um that's why and then with the 25 to 75 um that was our best effort at a mid-range zoom <clears throat> so it's super 35 plus we call it um now uh there are several people that could sit there and argue the um 
lack of consistency we have with formats in our industry that drives everybody. If you sell optics, the number of formats we have in our industry is the bane of your existence because you're trying to explain and show and you know there's and there's no standards and we're referencing old film stuff that really isn't applicable and then we're right. you know so it's a whole you know we could do another one on just formats but um <laughs> basically it covers it has a 36 millimeter image circle so super 35 as uh, depends on which we're you know three per four per film reference whatever you're talking about but generally agreed upon that super 35 is about a 31 millimeter 30 millimeter image circle somewhere around there uh depending on which reference of super 35 you're talking about um but um the Vistas have a 30 or the 25 to 75 has a 36 millimeter image circle, whereas the Vistas have a, a 46 and a half, 46.7 to be exact area of definition. So that's Vista vision, what red, um, you know, uh, marks as VB and uh, areas, the LF is very similar dimension. Um, so um, the 25 to 75 is kind of in between. So with red, they had, you know, helium, which is uh, going back to the film days, uh, APS. Uh, H, APS. which I think it's H, not C. Someone can tell me. Um, APSH was slightly wider. Um, okay. I have to reference um, Phil or somebody who probably knows. And but. then you had Gemini, which was taller. I was looking Correct. for Phil's yeah. sensor comparison chart. <laughs> so anyway, point being, we designed it for the large. Yeah, Dragon Six K was about APSH. Um, and I can explain where APH, APS came from for people that are interested, but it's not interesting. Um, so um, the, the 36 millimeter image circle was uh, what we designed it for. And that was our best attempt at making it as small as possible, but still compatible with some of the other, other than full frame formats. Um, so that's why we did that. And one of the things that we're gonna be showing soon is our 1.6 Tokina 1.6 expander makes that lens, um, work on full frame and it's really beautiful the flares are really nice on it you lose a little bit of light but with the sensitive the base sensitivity you still keep the same bokeh details that you would out of the base lens um now that's not me trying to explain away why you should buy a 1.6 for it make it full frame but if we made the 2575 full frame it would be big um and so and expensive or big and not expensive right which, and yeah. it's unfortunate that the camera manufacturers are heavily pushing full frame at this time it's fine that they are and it's a good tool but um as airy has proven with their airy 35 maybe just because it has the airy name on it, i don't think so it's a beautiful camera really <laughs> incredible camera uh one of the better in film and uh, digital cinema cameras even though it just came out as one of the better digital cinema cameras on the market in my opinion um and uh they've proven that format that 35 is still interesting in a tool and in fact if you look at it from an aspect of the number of users from a market research aspect of all the people that are shooting film and doing everything or shooting and doing everything the great majority of cameras out there are still super 35 and the great majority of like dock work and other things are super 35 because it's easier to work with in, in a mm -hmm. number of ways so um we're quite um we're quite proud of that lens and that proves that we can um make a very high quality zoom if you haven't seen it rented it try it please do it's an incredible lens um so that's where we're at and so then of course we are capable of doing that but um capable of doing a full frame version of it but it is going to be a lot bigger and a lot heavier or a lot bigger and a lot more expensive it's just the way it is um there are not enough people still shooting cinema to make these lenses more affordable because it's simply it's a quant it's a it's a quantity yeah. of number of people that can buy it so if you guys want cheaper cinema lenses get a bunch of people to start buying cameras and shooting film or shooting uh uh buying cinema cameras and lenses and then things will become more affordable <laughs> they already have <laughs> uh exponentially but the the total number of people that are shooting in our industry is is quite small um and so it's difficult to make products at a reasonable price point, it just is. So we have to fight that balance of format coverage versus whatever. And uh, a case in point of a full frame compact zoom, what that looks like in image quality, you know, the DZO zooms are the perfect example of that, or the Kata zooms or wh whatever they're using. You know, it's it's uh, uh, very affordable, but it, it comes at a price, you know, um, of Im pure image quality. And I'm not saying those are bad lenses. I'm just saying that right. there is a significant difference there's, there's between a DZO in, zoom yeah. and an Ingenue, which is one of the best companies on the planet at making zoom lenses. Um, so 
yeah. And, and, and the limitations of, of the number of buyers limits the amount of engineering dollars that you can spend to develop anything new either, as well. So you're yeah, very, it affects time to market everything. Yeah. Which is why like, like the vistas were designed to be timeless. Basically they, they they're designed to last forever that that would be pulled out off the shelf all the time. Um, which is interesting. Cool. Um, what, what things in, in in lens design what needs to happen to a lens to make it say faster and what makes to make it uh to make it sharper i mean what what parts of these lenses have to change and to what level so you got you got like the vista primes and let's say you want it and, and i don't know what the resolving power is and i, I, mean, I don't know if it, it, it's even able to be found out yet but i mean what would it take to make it sharper? What would it take to make that faster? What what kinds of things have to happen uh, to, for that to happen? It, well, is it, faster is just a function uh, primarily of the design and you know the combination of the elements and how can you get light to move efficiently through the lens, and that generally means larger elements, um, not always but mostly. And um, most people don't know this: the vistas are marked T one point five, and that's because in the cinema business we use T numbers versus F numbers because we're looking for the actual amount of light passing to the film plane or the sensor. Uh, F numbers in photography are relative to the focal length. So the vistas are anywhere from F 1.4 to F 1.2. Um, so you're talking about already pretty much as fast as it gets. And if you go vantage prove the point with their T one point or 1.0 lens, uh, or so they called it, um, you know, the image was, was a hot mess because when you get to that level, you're talking about hundred percent light transmission. There's no, there's no, there's no way to modify the light path. It just is right. what it is other than angle of view. And so uh, that's not a good thing. And so to make it faster, you know, there's iris design, there's, um, there's uh, index of glass is very important. There are different crystal format, crystalline um, com composition of glass. Uh, you know, silicates and all kinds of stuff. And I mean, there's um, lenses made from other extremely rare elements that they're only able to make in that size that have just absolutely incredible light transmission. And coatings help with that. So it's this whole combination of size of the optics, the design of the iris and location of the iris, you know, there's, there's, and, and then, you know, it's kind of like, uh, like a balloon, you push in on one side, something's going to pop out on the other. There's no there's no, it's like, it's like with, you know, high performance, anything, you know, there are sacrifices that are made, um, to reach, you know, whatever it is you want to do. So, um, and that's true of most anything. So, yeah. So it's, it's primarily the glass. Um, is yeah, is it lenses. wrong or completely oversimplified to say that like a, the, it's a light bucket. So the bigger, the, the bigger the elements at the front, the more light can come in, but then you're fighting inefficiencies in, in between. And so all of that is the, the dance of the balance, the coatings that's about fighting inefficiency or is that uh, reflections, a number of things, but it, it can increase Gl bare glass by itself has about a 96% um, uncoated, just regular bare glass has an, a, about a 96% light transmission. Um, and with certain crystalline, um, types of glass, higher density glasses, what they call more exotic glasses, you can get to, um, you can get to a 99 point, whatever, um, just off of that. Um, and uh, so if you use a combination of um, high crystal count, uh, con crystal concentration um, glass, um, it more efficient, and then you add even more efficient coatings, it increases the light transmission. And that's that's why a lot of the lenses you see, particularly from Japanese manufacturers, have a green flare, which people don't like, uh, or some people love, some people hate, whatever you will say. Um, and that's what we were trying to address with the Vista ones is the primary element is is more of a purple color, blue color, and, and there are ways to um, correct out the green in post-production. But um, in end of the day, that, that's why they're green is because of light transmission. And case in point, when we were developing the Vista ones, um, we had a red coated uh, Vista lens. Uh, it was it was all red, um, and the light transmission was awful. It was like T, whatever it was, I can't remember four or something really bad. Um, and so, uh, but it had really cool red flares, but it just didn't look good. 
Um, and so those coatings are important. Um, so, yeah. So, so what, what's involved? What was the, um, the, the, they were like T.75, the, the NASA lenses that, that, uh, um, it was F.75, which is different. Okay. Was it that? Okay. Focal length, were... you can have faster than light transmission because the, the location of the iris relative to the focal length will make it less than F1.0, which is hard for people to get their head around, but that's, right. yeah. So. Okay. Interesting. Um, uh, who's got questions out there? You got, you got time, get them in there. And then do you have something you want to show at all? Or you, you were, I, I know you wanted to poke around, but let's, let's give you some opportunity to poke around. And... Well, with Revar Cine, my other tiny little filter company that could, um, Which... I've gotten into making um, custom diopters um, or specialty diopters. So I have my new um, compression diopter which oh, um, has a clear window in the middle, uh, polished, and then it's got um, the regular diopter. I don't know if we can see that. But, yeah, you can see uh, it clearly. It's pretty cool. Vantage, Vantage uh, Film in Germany, they marketed these under the name of squeeze diopters um, several years ago, and they were um, ridiculously expensive because of the size of the number of companies that would actually buy them. Um, so I have reintroduced that. So these are cool. Um, I'm shooting some footage in the next couple of weeks to show what these do. Um, Interesting. so that's cool. And then, um, well, you, I have my you can donut. certainly tell the story of your, your, your filters that, uh, oh, that's another diet. Wow. Okay. That's a hole. <laughs> yeah. That's a donut diopter. So if you like donuts, there you go. Um, so <laughs> yeah, flat. Yeah, exactly. Good one. I was actually considering if you buy the entire set of them, because there's 12 of them with different hole sizes, if you buy the entire set, I was going to make a custom pink donut box. <laughs> you should. <laughs> like, you I mean, know. it needs to be done. <laughs> I mean, I, don't, I, I, I like to laugh at things. I like to, you know, like case in point with my Revarsini scarf dust and PA tears filters. Like, I just like to have fun. And I think anybody who doesn't get that, if you want, like there were some people like, when we get into the PA tiers thing, but it's like, you know, if you don't find it funny or enjoy it, you know, Tiffany it, and Schneider are over there, you know, they'll, pe you can people need to laugh at the them. world. But speaking yeah. of scarf, that's scarf dust right here uh, on that camera. And then this is the PA tiers. Mm. And it, it, it is, it's, it's, it's such an interesting look. And I, and I, I still have to finish <laughs> some stuff on that, but I, I love how, how they play off of each other. They're, they're completely different. Uh, and, and I tend to use the, uh, the PA tiers more on more telephoto and I like the scarf dust on, on wider, but scarf dust actually works nicely across all the range, but they're, they're, they're beautiful. They, I, I mean, I've, I've enjoyed having them on a lot of these live streams. People are like, what do you got going on? Why is it blooming up there? Oh, that would be the uh, scarf dust. Which, yeah. Yeah. Which, so scarf, scarf dust is a gold, um, a gold particulate. It's kind of like if glimmer glass and pro mist were kind of all in the same filter, but didn't have some of the effects that they do, you know, they don't, uh, it doesn't lift the contrast as much as a pro mist black pro mist would. And it doesn't, um, it doesn't quite hit the highlights the same way, uh, glimmer glass does. I don't know if you agree with that, but that's the way I feel about it. Um, so, um, that's if, what's up with scarf dust. If you're looking for rebar stuff, there there is a link down below in the, in the description section. And I think there's a coupon code out there still. <laughs> so, um, so so yeah, that's the that's the uh, scarf dust, um, and that the naming of that came out of um, I don't know why exactly, but I just remember it sticks in my head of of, of DPs wearing scarves. It seems to be a thing, right? right? <laughs> You see all these photos and, and I'm not saying it's wrong or it's weird or whatever. I, I have no problem with it. That's cool. But somehow it became like a thing. Maybe someone out there can explain to me what it is about a scarf. Is that a functional thing? With, with uh, honestly, shooting? most of the time they're wearing scarves because they're older and they don't want their turkey neck to show. That is literally why most of them are doing it. Uh, Makes sense. I think they need to bring back, what was the, uh, what was the seventies like, jumpsuit thing that every director would always wear with it, it was, a leisure suit <laughs> yeah it was, a, it was a leisure suit top but it was always beige it was always and every every director was like, hey sweetheart how you doing and they always wore that i think those need to come back maybe not the sweetheart part but you know the yeah 
Yeah. That, Everything will come back. Don't worry. I mean, yeah, the, it's, it's, the, it's ironic to me that all the teenagers are wearing like guest jeans these days because you know that was right. Everything comes back around. You know it, exactly. The bell bottoms made a, a return. And I I thought for sure that would never happen, and I, I'm kind of yeah. glad that the the waists of jeans are finally rising back up because I was <laughs> I was like you can't get lower. That's not technically possible, but I guess. It <laughs> Brian and Scott discuss, discuss jean fashion. Um, <laughs> you think that's funny? What? Um, <clears throat> so anyway, scarf dust. Yeah. So there was. It was on the. I saw it, and so I had this idea. What if you just snuck up behind DPs and shook the <laughs> dust off their scarves? The which, which the commercials the are, are hilarious. But... Yeah, yeah. We shot those. You know, uh, the scarf dust commercial. We we shot that one day up in the mountains in um, Southern California. And it happened to have snowed that day before we got super lucky. And so we were just out there and we didn't know what we were going to do. We were just like, let's have fun with it. There was no script or anything. And we're just like, okay, let's do this. Let's do that. And uh, of course the DP that shoots us for me, Neil Fernandez, is a good friend of mine and, and I believe incredibly talented at what he does. Um, he shot it with me, you know, for fun. And, um, mm -hmm. and uh, we didn't, the mistake we made was not showing actual footage through the filter. And also uh, it, we shot it in November, but it so happened to be released around April fools. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. And so people <laughs> thought it wasn't real. And so, which I actually enjoy about it because it's like, people don't know if it's real. It's, it's mysterious. It's a joke. It's, uh... I, you know, it's not, it's not something I made to be the next, black pro mist that everybody knows it's actually starting to gain some notoriety which is great and it's being used on some pretty large tv shows and features and stuff so it actually is getting somewhere but um i enjoy the fact that people think it's not real to be honest um it, it, it is a real filter you can buy <laughs> it, it is as so is pa tears it is are there any others are, are you still dreaming up stuff are you are you I have two running filters in... that I've developed, but I'm uh, literally waiting to find a name and a funny concept for the video. Um, it's uh, it's just one of those things. I'm involved in so many different projects. I haven't bothered to manufacture them or, or the design's done. They look great, but um, it's one of the things cool. I got to get to because I'm so I was so busy drilling holes and diopters and doing other things. Uh, <laughs> you know, so. you know, drop uh, drop some name ideas down in the comment section. I mean, if Phil can name. Uh, the the Vegas, then, then someone can name the next filter. Uh, well, maybe. the PA tears was almost grip sweat. That was the next one. It was <laughs> grip sweat. And, you know, I was like, something about me was like, I don't know, that sounds kind of gross. And I don't know if people will tell you it. But I mean, you can imagine the video, you know, you're holding up a boom pole and it's just like, I mean, it's gross. But yeah, that's, you know, that was the, the name. That was the leading name. I actually did a, vi a poll on uh, Video Village Group. Um, you know, asking people to name it. And so it was named by the community. It wasn't necessarily named by me. Maybe, so. maybe do another one, like, like a streak filter where it, it yeah. does like white streaks and then just call it the, the grip heaven and just put streaks on the glass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, um, there's a bunch of, uh, anyway, the point is I've noodled it around. Uh, the PA tiers I think is hilarious. I enjoy it. The people who think it's hilarious buy it. I got a ton of hate on that one from people that apparently have no sense of humor. Um, obviously we all PA'd at one time, you know, yeah. even I who have not shot a very much film at all in my, or cinema much of my life have done PA for either for one reason or another, mostly just to learn, but um, you know, and so it's obviously, it's not an abuse thing. It's just the reality is that PAs are, you know, your bottom, the totem pole and you got to deal with what happens and, and yeah, you got to get coffee and do different things. I actually have the um, the coffee order from the uh, PA tiers um, is here. It's a it's a six foot scroll. Um, so <laughs> you know, we had fun with it. But PA tiers, a lot of people were really um, against that name for whatever reason. Like I said, they don't have a sense of humor, in my opinion. But um, but yeah, so. Considering the next name of the next filter, I got to think of it. And it sounds silly that I'm waiting for a name, but it really, for me, it's the fun of it. And yeah, um, I mean, you, you gotta you gotta fun. go with your, your your talents, you know. You, you <laughs> and if you but apparently you know, I mean, my talents are not that great because I can't I can't decide on a name for the next. Or maybe one. there's just so many that you you can't narrow them down. It's, That's what it marketing. is, really. Actually, it's marketing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just it's proof in point that that there are a lot of great filters out there. I can maintain there are a ton of great filters out there that 
should be more popular, but they're not marketed correctly, which sounds silly. And you would think that DPs just pick stuff based off of whatever, but there's so many diffusion filters out there. You have to get people's attention to say, hey, check this out. And uh, then one guy uses another person says, hey, this is great, you know, uh, because most of us don't have time to test 400 filters, that, you know, a Kessel camera well, and, or whatever and run through the And let's thing. be honest, there is no marketing for filters like this. The, the, it's not done. They're just, just hey, try this. And then so-and-so used it. And then so-and-so used it. I mean, yours, I don't think there's ever been a commercial or, or a fake commercial even uh, for yeah. a filter. I don't think I've ever seen one before. Well, it's a pet peeve that I have in general of, I find that most of the companies in our business really have in the cinema industry have a serious problem with taking themselves too seriously and also just not marketing um, properly or at all. And so and it comes through because there's all these great tools out there that nobody has any idea exists because the companies just don't do a good job of putting it out there. And I'm not saying that I know exactly what to do, but you know, uh, the scarf dust and PA tiers proves the point because if I had called it, you know, magic gold or whatever, you know, people would be like, whatever, you know, but you call it scarf dust. Like, what is that about? You know, Cine flow X, you know? Yeah, that, exactly. That's, right. That's, um, that would have been, you know, shopped all around a, a marketing team and they would have loved the sound and it makes, it makes you feel like you're in a forest, but I mean, that's not yeah, fun. well, I was I was involved in the development of the Hollywood Black Magic, as I say, and so then I followed up because on larger sensors, the Hollywood Black Magic has some issues with um, because the the size of the little lenslets that create the flare can be much more easily imaged on a, on a large sensor, and particularly on red sensors, they seem to interact really weirdly, in my opinion. Um, and so they just weren't made for that; they were made for smaller sensors. <clears throat> Uh, so I followed up with Tokina. We made the Black Alchemy, which is a uh, the lenslets, the diffusion um, halation aspect of it is different, and in a in a way that's designed for large format. So that's a name that I came up with because I was like, well, you know, Black Magic. What's you know, uh, we're we're innovating here. Let's call it Black Alchemy. So um, that you know, some of the names are organic. An interesting fact: the original name for the Hollywood Black Magic was classic black soft which they actually did it was different but um hollywood black magic is a little bit different but so the point is there are unimaginative names out there and i did not name the hollywood black magic i was in the room when it happened but i didn't name it uh, bob zupka did and um uh or possibly ron ingleton who uh recently left the company but he was there at the same time so um yeah but my Ranger guess too. would be that a lot of the hate that you got was probably in the Hollywood area versus the rest of the world, or was it? I uh, no, they every round really? we showed it to every DP we showed there, like this is great. I love the name. I, I don't think anybody. I'm sure people had a problem. With, people have a problem with everything, but somebody out there <laughs> has a problem with everything. So um, yeah, I mean, I was uh, I, I was saddened uh, when you know I I love like the last 15 years of this industry and how much sharing has gone on, how much people are not clasping on to their ideas and not at, at, you know, the secret sauce kind of thing. And this last city year, I was, I was watching a lecture and the whole conversation was keep your secrets to yourself. Stop telling people stuff. And I'm like, why, why, why? Well, I, I think that kind of comes out of the, um, Elon Musk thing and also the whole um, there's a pattern in our industry of, of because there's such a lead time of development and companies are not really particularly confident in what they're doing always that they want to make sure that there's market acceptance or they want to make sure they get a certain number of orders to manufacture something either at the correct price point or the correct volume to meet demand um, but um, the the um, uh, you know, Elon Musk said um, when it was recently or whatever, he was saying, you know, uh, don't don't talk about stuff, just do it, you know, and and I've kind of taken that approach more like I didn't really talk about, you know, my flat top compression filled diopters or my donut diopters before I did them, you know, and, and I have some things coming that I'm not I'm only talking to a few people about and I'm just going to put it out there. And, you know, we'll see what happens. And you got to take that risk. That's what it is. It's, it's a risk thing. Um, and as far as like, um, as far as like, um, from a creative standpoint, I'm not a creative like you guys are. So I, I don't know for sure. But I think it's kind of the same thing. It's like, just do it, you know, just drop it out there. It's so much better as a manufacturer when you just put a product and you go, 
it's shipping, you know, instead of, oh, right. it'll ship later and later. Right. And there's some of that we still do. We did that with Tokina on the 180 because we had to tell some feature films that were requesting it in rental companies, we're going to do it. And so, you know, that's different when you have, when you're building on a series of something, you know, it's like, okay, we're doing that. But to talk about something or announce something before it's done is, is not, oh, private conversations are one thing, but to say that publicly is, an, is another story. So. Well, and it's, it's, you know, it's like uh, Jared uh, with Red that would, would with the whole Komodo thing and people were livid that, you know, he's teasing this camera a year plus before it's even remotely available. And I mean, it, it was, it was truly shocking to me that people would get so mad at that when they're sharing, they're, they're trying to, and you, know, you, you talk about the risk and, and they don't want to put things out with their concern of the risk that needs to open up. I, I want to take that risk, take, take a chance. It's, it's cheaper anyway to take the chance than to do all the research anyway. <laughs> I yeah, I mean, it's it's different approaches. I think you know, uh, uh, and I I don't know what I'm talking about here for sure, but um, I would say you know, with doing something like making a cinema camera, um, you know, I want to talk about a moving target that nobody will ever be happy with. Um, right. I mean, everybody I'm talking about, you know. So I understand what Jared was doing there, and I understand what sometimes what people are doing because you do get that that thing that happened at Schneider all those years ago, where where things get developed in a black box and then it comes out and it's like. It's like, who this, are you developing you know? this for? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I get that. But yeah, I think in general, uh, my my new thing is just just do it. <laughs> just well, yeah. make it happen. Uh, Ernesto wants to know if there's going to be a quarter PA tiers. Okay. So I sell one strength of PA tiers for one reason. I don't want to answer questions about which one to use. I don't <laughs> want to stop more than one thing. Um, so PA tier, if it was an eighth to a two, if that was the scale, which it is, I actually know which one it is. It's a quarter. It actually is a quarter. Uh, and, um, so I can make an eight for anybody that wants it. I can make a one or a two or whatever you want. I can but don't, you, but you're not allowed to ask questions. You have to sign a document that says you won't ask which straight to wear. You know, yes, no, but I just, <laughs> it makes my life in, infinitely easier because it format, you know, cause I, I run sales for format high tech uh, cinema division. And I, we spend a lot of our time, the guys on my team spend a lot of their time answering questions and showing videos and whatever. And it's fine. That's great. And we're format high tech Schneider Tiffin. They're addressing a different, that's a different kettle of fish, right? I mean, you need those tools. And that's actually the downside of the scarf dust and the PA tiers becoming as popular as they have is that now people are asking for other. And so I'm like, do I make a half scarf? Do I make, well, you could, you could continue to go. PA you could have uh PA sniffles, PA waterworks, right? Have, exactly. Uh, PA right. allergies, so, where it's just a hint, but <laughs> no, I'm gonna make. So I'll make Ernesto an eighth, and then um, you know, tell him it was a thousand dollars to develop, and uh, <laughs> there you go. right, Ernesto. <laughs> uh, no, I can make one for you. Whoever, whatever density you want, I can make it. If you contact me, I just don't put it out there because I just don't want to deal with it. I just, you know, it's the reality is. Most of the people that buy my products, you know, diffusion filters, they're better off just being said, this is the one that pretty, because I, it's not, I didn't just pick a quarter and be like, this is what people are using. It's based off of actual research what, with that particular looks, filter and showing people. Right. Yeah. Cause like, yeah, cause like scarf dust is, is a completely different look. And it, this one looks, uh, uh, the PA tiers looks different a lot on wides. And it's, I, I, I guess it's a, I don't know. Is, is is it also a stronger? But I know it's different. But is it also stronger? Yeah. Or okay. it's still so a that... quarter as well. But the the silver material. So scarf dust is gold. PA tiers is silver. They're they're, they're the same thing. Interesting. Um, it's just one is different color, and the silver has a lot more light scatter. And you can see it in your image there. The the bare ball, the practicals you have there have this really nice bloom to them. Yes. Um, but your your black levels are not destroyed um which that's is true. which is a thing and so that's why scarf yeah. dust is more popular um and so this is pa tears which i mean with you this light right here just i mean it just blows it out with, with yeah bloom. it's no it's a specific use case it's it's a stronger filter it has it has its uses um but um i i made it um because because it's 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 the polar opposite, you know, so you got to, you know, why not offer the polar opposite? And also I just, you know, I had to do something. I, I couldn't help myself. I wanted to make another video. So 
<laughs> Living out my SNL fantasies. I mean, I, I can I can help you make some some funny videos if you want some remote funnies that made for 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 that kind of stuff. Yeah, we've had a bunch of ideas, and we're like, you know, those videos aren't you know how expensive it is to produce a proper video. You know, I mean, it, it, the scarf dust video, I think it didn't cost us that much money, maybe two or three thousand dollars, and everybody was working for free. You know, and the and the um the uh the pa tiers were a much higher production value you know so it's not it's not free to do this stuff in terms right, of right. time more in terms of actual money to shoot at production costs so um but yeah i love i i got a bunch of ideas and stuff we can do but no i'm too busy <laughs> making things making things uh so yet phil's pointing out that there's now a 10 times focal length range from 18 to 180 and that 180 at, at t15 is an accomplishment t19 t19 uh yeah Phil, come on now. Yeah, I thought it because uh, there's also one other that's not T15, right? Uh, nope, they're all they're all, they're all they're of them. All okay, okay, mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, the reason we those... didn't make it 1.5 is it would have gone to a 136 millimeter front, which is like the size of an ingenue 12 to one. <laughs> it's just giant, and also T1.5 on on that that division, level of zoom. <laughs> you know you're going to be firing focus pullers left it's just not a thing you know we don't we don't like that much hate mail we're already getting hate mail at t1.9 from focus pullers going i can't even you know i mean it's 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 i mean it's a joke but still it's like that's really that that is really stupidly fast because that's an f1.4 i mean that's just nuts it's uh, an f1.4 180 you know i mean you're talking the only the only thing that ever come close was like some Leica lenses i mean it's not you know, and to control chromatic aberrations and things, you know, it's not just because I work work for the company, but I can tell you, like, that is truly a feat of optical engineering. Just ab and the fact that it fits in a one fourteen front, you know, and it really doesn't weigh that much more or much bigger than the one thirty five. It's a little bigger, but it's not, you know. So um, it's it's significantly large, but it's not that big. It's it's yeah. It's a big piece of glass. I mean, you look at the front element; it goes right up to the metal. I mean, there's no you know, what we call the clear aperture. It's like the that, and then there's three millimeters of metal in the element. So are, uh, that the, the coding that you now have on the vistas, how's, uh, how are people responding to that? That uh, the Vista one or the vistas? The, no, the, no, the, uh, on the outside, the, the custom coding that colors that you could do on that. Oh the, yeah. The Cerakote thing that, yeah. uh, that is the direct, um, fault of a good friend of mine. Who's a DP who was, uh, he has a, uh, uh, we have a friend that owns a motorcycle shop and, um, you know, does Cerakoting parts. And it was just kind of a, what if we did this? And uh, quite frankly, we had nothing better to do because we're in the middle of all of our production cycles right now. I mean, we just, we came up with 180 and the way our production cycle is working, it's not that we don't have new ideas. It's just the way the timing has worked out, mostly through fault of the pandemic, which everybody loves to, you know, pin them every excuse on, but it's true. Um, so, we're in the middle of it. So we were like, let's do something fun. So the Cerakote with custom colors for the Vistas and it actually has a function. It, you can do it black. You know, if, if you ever had, everybody has lenses where particularly if they're painted, uh, the paint comes off, right? Old light is mm -hmm. current lenses. Um, Cerakote doesn't do that. It's UV proof. It is bomb proof. Like it is, you could drag it across the parking lot behind your car and it would not come off. Um, so <laughs> It has a function, but it's very expensive because it's a labor-intensive hand process to do it. Um, so as a result, uh, you know, freely admit, we haven't had that many people take advantage of it. And it was mostly just, and we have had people do that, but um, it, it's mostly because of the, um, the time involved. And so we did it, we announced it because we had nothing better to do. <laughs> we were like, okay, well, this is, hey, look, we put green on a Vista, you know, and um, and there are people that commented like, this is the dumbest thing ever, and then other people love it. But that's the truth with anything you do that's custom, you know, uh, there are people that absolutely love, you know. Uh, the people put special wheels in their car. People want the, they, they, they buy a car, and then they immediately put a $5,000 uh, wrap on it. And it's, you know, yeah, people but like if you customers. can think, if you can think of something that you want to color on your vistas, we can do it. We can also do other lenses. We can do the 25, 25. We could even do, we don't talk about it, but we could do, you know, your sigmas if you want. It doesn't matter. It's, it's a, it's a coding process. So, so Phil's talking about the, the depth of field at 180 at T one nine at six feet is, is basically your eyelashes are in focus or the end of your eyelashes in focus and your, the, the eyeball is not in focus. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Brent has a good question. Besides 
more than likely the 180. What was the hardest Vista to develop? And any good stories wrapped that you can uh, share? Uh, the hardest ones to develop were probably the 21 and 29 and not because so much the technical reasons, but because of, how do I put this? Taking a risk on developing further. Cause it's a pretty big deal to go from standard focal lengths into the weird middles, you know? And the only reason that happens with any of these manufacturers is because there's enough DPs demanding that they can use these you know, to be a proper feature film set, you've got to have at least nine lenses in your set, at least. I mean, we're talking about for the big ones, you know, and of course there's examples and people argue that, but that's the reality that we're seeing with, you know, major rental companies like Keslo and Camtech and Panavision. These guys, and TCS, they, these guys are, are demand, their customers are demanding, these DPs are demanding a lot of focal lengths to get down because they have the time to pick those shots and do that sort of thing so uh, because of the large budget so so that's what so i'd say the 21 and 29 were possibly the most difficult um what? to do from but but technically i would say it's probably the 135 and the one and the well let me rephrase telephotos are, are much easier to get right than than uh, it's within a certain speed like a t2.8 telephoto most optical designers could do that in their sleep you know it's not a, it's not a big deal to make a good one of those but it uh well without breathing is another thing but um yeah so i'd say on the wides are more challenging so the 21 29 for a number of reasons both from a standpoint of of making it from customer demand and also the technical capabilities of keeping all of the lenses inside that 114 front is is a big deal um at the speed that they are what what is it why would a a 35 and a 50 be you know this big uh, vertically height of uh, the size of the lens but a 40 has to be longer what 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 is it that drives that that can't be done from one to the other yeah it's just the simple physics of the optics and, and at a certain focal length you have to stretch things out further to to reach the um the coverage primarily it's primarily a sensor coverage issue um if you're talking about a small sensor coverage you can make all the lenses the same length like with the vedras you know they were all the same length because it's a small, small tiny sensor and right you know not a big deal um and a lot of manufacturers they they build a certain like canned housing so to speak and then they just fit everything inside of there like like the and you see that with macros and other things where they like element way down in there um you know that's a different reason, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, that'd be why, you know, it's kind of a, kind of a boring answer, but that's you know, the reality. <laughs> but Boggs is saying, hi, how are you doing on time? Uh, hey, um, I, I can go, you know, I'm having fun. I'll, I'll go another, I can push it off another 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we got, uh, Curtis out there saying, yo, we got, uh, Carlos out there, Phil's having, Oh, Bob fun. asked, uh, Bob asked something about the slim. Yeah. The slim in these. Yeah, so the for those who don't know, the Firecrest filter is, of course, very popular, as we discussed, in um, feature films and all over the place. Um, we came out with the slim ones, which is an idea I had a long time ago, and I always reached a lot of resistance from the companies that I was working with on that, like Schneider and even Format in the early days. Um, so um, the we did the slim ones, which are, so a standard cinema filter is four millimeters thick, four by five or four by four or six by six, whatever. I mean, the reason that they're that thick is not just because of durability, it's because of flatness. It's really hard to make a thin filter flat because it, it, especially larger ones, it, it literally distorts and there's machines that measure that flatness, you know, inferometers that measure the flatness of the filter in microns, you know, thousands of an inch. and and it comes out with this, you know, green and red and, you know, looks kind of like a heat signature, like predator thing where like, you know, and what you're showing is the flatness of the filter. Um, that's not, even though the, the lenses have increased and in, the cameras have increased in resolution, um, that's not so much a thing. Uh, flatness of the filter is not so much demanded. It is very important on telephotos. So if you have a telephoto, I don't recommend using a two millimeter super slim because it's just technically not as flat as that. And when you telephoto, you're magnifying things to a level. Um, and when I say telephoto, we're talking over 200 millimeters. So, um, which is rare also, but, um, and also in telephoto, you're running into infrared imaging issues where you can actually see like, looks like heat waves coming off the pavement right. and stuff. Um, but, but the slims we came out with and because 
thanks to the photography people, there's so many photography people out there or used to be even so that bought SLRs. Like I always call them anesthesiologists with my, my, when I worked in the camera store, I loved anesthesiologists. They come in, they work like 10 hours a week. They have absolutely nothing to do. They make like half a million dollars a year. And so they buy expensive photo gear and shoot with it. And so thanks to all these anesthesiologists out there, there's two millimeter photo filters everywhere. They're ubiquitous. They're everywhere. There's, there's, thousands and thousands, millions of them. And so the production volumes are higher. So we're able to make a lower cost filter. The cost for producing a four mil, if you're just making a hundred to something, the cost for producing a two millimeter filter versus a four millimeter filter is the same. There's no, no difference there at all. But when you're making tens of thousands of a filter, like we are with the Firecrest two millimeter filters, we cut it into a four by five size, mostly because the Misfit Atom, the Bright Tangerine Atom has a clamping mechanism Mm -hmm. And then we designed a special four by five airy tray that holds the two millimeter. And then there's the map boxes like the small rig, you know, $70, $100 map box that actually performs better with slim filters because of the fit, the way they designed it. So um, it's incredibly useful. And they're only 200. I think we just had finally raised the price with inflation, but they're around 200 bucks. So, um, yeah. I had never considered the thickness of a filter affecting telephoto, but that completely makes sense. That's, that is wild. Yeah. Huh. Carlos, I like question here. <laughs> Carlos, uh, color neutrality. Yeah. Um, so the reason that color neutrality is difficult is, um, if you take a new to neutral color, you have to have, um, all the color channels balanced, red, green, blue. Um, and in a one stop filter, an ND point three, it's cutting 25% of the light. You can have any one color channel off as much as 25% and visually to the eye, it will be imperceptible for neutral. So think about that. That's crazy. Um, and that's a huge variance, you know, uh, but when you, it halves for every stop that you go down. So every stop at, at a point six, now you've got 12 and a half percent that anything can be off. By the time you get down to a six stop filter, you're talking about fractions of a percent. Right. So that's why they're difficult. And ND filters were originally dye based. So there's there's literally a bath of dye and there's a computer controlled dip that goes on in the old days. It was hand dip where it goes in, it sits in the bath for a certain amount of time. And that's how much the resin that goes in between the glass soaks up the density. And so, you know, I don't remember the real numbers, but, you know, let's say an ND six is is 20 minutes and I think it's a lot less than that. But, you know, it's a certain amount of time for different densities. Well, that bath is constantly changing in density. So when you manufacture dye-based neutral densities, we're talking like 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, this time frame. Um, and there's still some that are dye-based uh, that are manufactured, um, but uh, like color grads and things like that, and also NDs. So if you have that kind of difference in neutrality, um, that's a problem. And so um, we made, and that's the beauty of the carbon-based IRND filters that are originally firecrest and matoma were the only two and now there's a you know everybody on the sun's got one um which there are differences between those but um the dye based irnds the original ones were <laughs> i don't know if i gotta slow down carlos <laughs> he blew his mind apparently um <clears throat> no that's just the way carlos looks he he, he lost his uh, goatee so he did. yeah right <laughs> so sorry that's just Really Sidetrack. Uh, the, the um, I'm probably moving too fast for everybody, but the no, point you're being totally that, fine. People can go back and rewatch this, and they they can slow it down because yeah. you can watch YouTube at half speed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which I figure they have so, to do when I talk anyway. But yeah, the, yeah, yeah. So so, the, so car. That's there's a number of reasons why the original IRNDs, the Shire Platinum and the the Tiffin IRND, not the current ones, but the older ones. Um, there's a reason that those were um, the way they were and uh, because they were dye based and also there were some rare earth elements that were interacting with UV light, making them yellow and green and other colors. But the, the, the carbon based ones, because they're an electronic deposit and not a dye based, they're much more even tone. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice, but it is the even tone um, on them. And that's because it's a significantly easier <laughs> to make carbon you know, electronic vapor deposit on the glass and keep it neutral because you're not dealing with a bath of dyes that is changing and then rare earth elements inside of it that are changing even more. And so, 
Yeah. How, how many different coatings get applied to like, like filters and lenses? I mean, how many passes are having to be done? Because that's that's it's a vapor that's that's applied in like electrostatic or something. That, that yeah, solid. in a vacuum chamber. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how many different coatings could go into a design of a filter and or a lens element? Um, it varies, but, um, uh, you know, I don't want to say for sure, uh, not because it's a secret, but because I can't okay. accurately comment on that other than I know that it's multiples and it's different from every one. I don't know the exact number that goes into a fire crest. It, it's multiples, but I don't Fair know enough. the exact number. Uh, just because I know the transmission, I know what I need to know, which is the transmission. I've seen them being made. I know how they interact with the sensor. So, um, Kevin says he hopes he contributed to the success of the twenty nine. <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how would one know when buying an ND if the design is carbon or dye based? Uh, well, dye based filters are pretty easy to spot because the manufacturer primarily only provides them up to one point two. Um, so, um, that'd be why, um, also you can hold them up and generally see really easily, but anything that is labeled ND for the most part is going to be a traditional dye based ND filter. Anything that is, um, there are only a few of them, but primarily the platinum IRD and the pro stop or the, yeah, the format pro stop and also the, uh, Tokina or no, Tiffin IRD, um, were all dye based. Otherwise, um, you know, they, if it's if it says IRND um, and it's recent manufacture, it, it nine times out of ten, it's it's really hard to find dye based NDs unless they're used. Um, and, and manufacturers have them sitting on the shelves; they'll be happy to sell them to you at a great discount because they can't sell them. But it's you know, uh, and and up to four stops, as I mentioned between previously, with the different um, levels of uh, of uh, color balance channel uh, color ch channel balance. Um, you know, you're not going to see a lot of them beyond that. So, <laughs> Phil, uh, yeah, King says time to grab some, grab some Vista Primes now. Indeed, uh, mm -hmm. Phil says Indies in 2022. You should. Uh, that's just yeah, that's uh, very punny. And then Carlos, uh, do coatings fade over time? Ultraviolet because IRNDs are are still have we, those rare earth elements. They are subject to color shift based on UV exposure. Um, <clears throat> we've made several iterations on the Firecrest. We're on our third iteration of them uh, to resolve some of those issues. But um, every filter company that's been making IRNDs has had issues with it over time. Uh, I would say it's pretty well nailed down now. Um, I, I, I would say that it's very unlikely that you're going to experience any issues with that. Um, I have noticed that these surface coated IRNDs, the ones that are not sealed inside of glass, um, because there is a difference of bonded where the coatings are inside the filter and then there's ones that are on the surface now from a purely technical argument the coated ones that are on the surface of the filter are better performing but we're talking about in the same way that you measure a high performance sports car that, that goes zero to 60 in one mile an hour more than the other one it's not it's not a significant appreciable difference so yeah but it is measurable which is why yeah. it's important yeah Okay. Yep. I got three minutes and I got to go. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, do you, I mean, three, three minutes. Do you have anything that you, you I mean, just go ahead and, and chat for three minutes. Just say everything you'd like to say. Where can they find cool. information and all that? Good yeah. Stuff. You can go to Tokina cinema, USA.com format, high tech, USA.com revar cine.com. Those are all things that I'm involved with, um, that are public anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, there's, you know, uh, you know, I like to say, I like to pride myself on the idea that I'm I'm accessible to anyone I can be as much as possible. So if you have a question, if we're not Facebook friends, friend me, I'll be happy to talk about anything. Send me a message. Um, you know, um, you know, we can debate the Hollywood super hunks or whatever it is you want to do. But uh, I try to keep it to uh, optics. But yeah, more than happy to help. So, and and, and you're some sometimes funny. Uh, so you know, if if you have a, a pun you want to throw back. Uh, he can sometimes uh, send them back to you. Sometimes, sometimes not, yeah, yeah, not. not. <laughs> Depends on if um, my kids are yelling at me or whatever's going yeah, on. So. Yeah, uh, Ryan, thanks so much for your time. Uh, we, we'll uh, we'll you. try to have you on at some point. Let some time pass, and and let's let's we'll we'll 
like try to go narrow on, on something. Let, and, some, and let some things percolate. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining us on the live stream. Really appreciate your time. I, I know people are going to go back and listen to this because there's a bunch of golden nuggets in there and golden nugget would be a great filter name, um, the, especially if it's using gold. Um, yeah. But thank you so much. Uh, Takina, Takina Cinema USA, RevarCine.com, FormatHighTech.com. Sure. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah. And, and you know. yep, Ryan Avery. And uh, I'm going to drop you down, and then I'm going to close it out for everybody, and I'll, I'll speak to you in just one second. Here, one second. Oh. So that was our, our, our little interview with, with Ryan. Uh, thank you, everyone, who participated and asked all the questions that uh, definitely keep the conversation lively. And I really appreciate it. Remember to support down below. If you are looking for Revar stuff, there's there's a link down below. There's a little coupon code there. Shh, shh, don't, don't, don't tell anybody. I don't think Ryan can hear that. Um, but uh, as always, as I like to leave it, don't let your passions center around your life. Let your life center around your passions. <laughs>